Coming up on KPBS Evening Edition, the head of several San Diego hospitals says emergency room medicine has become the nation's de facto health care plan. We put the head of Scripps Health on the record. San Diego researchers say getting to the bottom of what causes autism is imperative as more children are diagnosed with it. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. I'm Dwayne Brown. The former leader of a violent Mexican drug cartel has been sentenced to 25 years in a U.S. prison. Fronteras reporter Jill Ropogol was at the courthouse for the sentencing, and she joins us now from the News Center. Jill, prosecutors say this is a virtual life sentence for Benjamin Ariano Felix, but not everyone is happy with it. How come? Well, 25 years is a pretty uh, short sentence compared to some of the lower ranking members of this cartel and of other Mexican drug cartels. Um, his own brother got life in prison just a few years ago uh, by the same judge. Uh, but this was the maximum allowed under the plea deal, 25 years. And um, the U.S. Attorney Lori Duffy says that this 20, these 25 years plus 17 years of a sentence that he still needs to serve in Mexico um, by the time he gets out of both of those, he'll be in his 90s, and so she says that it's a virtual life sentence. Does this mark the end of the Tijuana cartel? Well, it kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, DE, there was a DE agent there who spoke at the press conference afterwards who said, this is the end of the cartel, we don't have to ever deal with them again. And then um, Laura Duffy came back and said, well, actually, there are still some factions of the cartel that are active in Tijuana, and in fact, um, there is a pretty active uh, faction of the Ariano Felix cartel still operating in Tijuana. Uh, they seem to have made some sort of deal with the Sinaloa cartel and that, um, according to many analysts, is why the violence has, has sort of um, not come to a halt but has calmed down in Tijuana, but it's sort of a tentative piece. KPBS reporter Jill Rapogo. Federal agents have arrested more than 3,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records. The six-day nationwide sweep included San Diego. A dozen people were arrested here. Immigration agents say they were looking for people convicted of serious crimes and fugitives. The government says it was the largest sweep of its kind ever. There's a lower price tag for California's planned high-speed rail system. The authority in charge scaled back the design and dropped the cost by $30 billion. The new plan includes existing commuter lines in the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles. The chairman of the High-Speed Rail Authority says he wants the private sector to help build the link to San Diego. Today, the San Diego Housing Commission celebrated the opening of a new affordable housing complex in Torrey Highlands. Park Terramar is a 21-unit apartment complex with rents ranging from about $700 for one bedroom to just over $1,100 for three-bedroom units, well below market rates. The apartments are reserved for low-income families. The recession forced a lot of business owners in San Diego to close up shop. Today, a unique downtown cafe reopened its doors after closing two years ago. Good afternoon. I love Pierre's. Yeah, you love Pierre's? I love it. Working to get people back into this cafe on 5th and Ash Streets is Pierre Jean-Luc. You have coffee? I love it. You have salad? And you have some of the old customers coming back. Ruth Valentino works for the court system downtown. I go, they have the same stuff as before, and um, good, good options, and um, the prices are still about the same, so prices didn't go up. <laughs> I had just a regular Caesar salad and uh, the cheddar and broccoli soup. Yeah. And I had the Tuscan chicken panini and the Southwest black bean vegan yeah. soup. Delicious. Pierre's Cafe is a partner agency of Father Joe's Villages, a safe haven for San Diego's homeless people for decades. The books and artwork were donated, and like the food and desserts, it's all up for sale to benefit Tucson Academy for Homeless Teens. You know, if we can get kids off the street now, they're not going to end up down at our village downtown. We recently um, put, placed someone in an internship at um, Sodexo at the military base, and he was hired on um, at a great wage, and he has 40 hours a week, and so he's working on um, saving that money and then ha finding a house. Jean-Luc's hard work is paying off, too, attracting more customers to Pierre's Café. Welcome to Estora Pierre, the news place. 
Pierre's is now open from 9 until 2 in the afternoon weekdays and also offers a catering service. The internship gives Academy students a sense of pride in owning and running a business. Last week, the CDC reported an increase in the number of children diagnosed with autism up 78 percent. Today is World Autism Awareness Day, and Joanne is talking about it at the Evening Edition Roundtable. That CDC report found there are now 1 in 88 children diagnosed with autism. That's compared to 1 in 150 just 10 years ago. Joining me are Dr. Eric Corshain, Director of UC San Diego Autism Center of Excellence, and Dr. Michael Nelson, pediatrician at Kaiser Permanente. Thank you both for being here. Mm, it's a pleasure to be here. So, Dr. Corshain, the CDC study looked at 8-year-olds across 14 states. Mm -hmm. Now, did they find that more kids were being, being diagnosed or in in fact, are there more kids being affected by autism? The study didn't make a distinction between the two. So from the study, it can't be told uh, whether there is a greater rate of detection of kids that have always gone undetected previously or whether there is an increase in those who are affected. So detected or affected is the big question. But the study does demonstrate that across the last decade, there has been an increase in the prevalence based on new and improved methodologies and surveillance strategies. And so that's very important. It also uh, shows that autism is a, a, a very high incidence or a prevalence uh, disorder. And that one in 88 is uh, masking that one out of 57 boys will become autistic. Because boys and are one more at of, risk. They're at higher risk. And one, one out of 252 girls will become autistic. So there's a much higher rate or risk of autism among, among boys than, than girls. And so the study shows that. The other, the, the other thing that the study showed that's very important is that different locales have different rates. So some locales that, uh, that were part of the study had rates as low as about four to five per thousand. And then others had rates as high as 21 per thousand. So there's a very big difference in the rates across the different locales of the 14 states study. Now, Dr. Nelson, we understand there's a, a variety of screening methods uh, that you can use in order to detect autism. Can you sort of describe some of them briefly for us? Well, anytime a child comes in for a well baby check, be it two weeks or a year or two years, anytime they come in for a, a routine checkup, there's a number of things that a good pediatrician, a good family practitioner will look for to make sure that whatever age that child is, that their development is within that range that we would expect to see for that child at that age. And so if I have a child at any given age that isn't doing the things communication-wise, socially-wise, developmentally-wise, motor, motor coordination-wise that I would expect that child to be able to do, then it starts to raise a little bit of a red flag uh, and it says, hey, we need to look at it this a little bit more in detail. There are specific questionnaires that go along with that. So it's a combination of uh, the pediatrician's skill and, and, and background and expertise, but also based on specific questionnaires that we, we go on for every different child at, at every different checkup. We also hear about the spectrum of autism. So are we also finding, does this study sort of tell us or indicate that perhaps uh, there are more sort of conditions that are now falling under that spectrum of autism. What the study shows is that there's a wide range of ability among individuals that are diagnosed with autism. So among those eight-year-olds, you can see those that actually have substantial cognitive abilities, but others that have marginal cognitive abilities where they're struggling a little bit, and then still others that have um, um, unfortunate uh, intellectual disabilities. But what holds them together is the, is the disability involving social communication, the ability to understand another person's perspective, another person's emotional state, the ability to reflect and to portray one's own uh, social and emotional uh, intentions to someone else. So that real higher order human social communication um, ability is what's a problem for children with autism, whether they have higher intellectual abilities or medium or lower intellectual abilities. Dr. Nelson, why is it so important to diagnose autism early? That's a really good question. Uh, it's been clearly shown that uh, children with pretty much any developmental delay, including autism, if we can pick up on exactly who they are and what their 
specific problems are at an early age and get them referred, diagnosed appropriately, and then into early treatment, that those <coughs> children stand far and above ahead of what they otherwise would be. So if we can get them in early, get them the diagnosis and the treatment early, they you know, very quickly will show either improvement or uh, stability in, in where they are with things. And so it's, it's the earlier the better. So work with your pediatrician and if you have concerns. We don't have a lot of time left, Dr. Crochet, but I read one article uh, about this study that had mentioned this is now epidemic, an epidemic. And if we keep going in this direction um, of increasing, the, the, the numbers will be staggering. What do we do about this? Well, the, the fact that there is such a high prevalence of autism means that there's going to be uh, heavy demands for services, all the way from uh, babies who see their pediatrician and need help, need to be identified, need to get into uh, early uh, treatment programs, through school age, where you have a, a large number of individuals that are affected with autism, may have good intellectual capabilities, but uh, social understanding may not be where it needs to be. So school services are um, impacted by a large number of, of individuals. What it really says is that it's very important to discover what the causes of autism are. Before one starts uh, talking about um, anything um, in the way of an epidemic, you really need to understand what the causes are. And, and that still is, uh, of, of, it's become quite clear that it's a disorder that begins in prenatal life in the vast majority of cases. And that it's likely to be that the second trimester is a crucial period of brain development when something is going wrong. and that creates a cascade of abnormal organization of the brain and, or, and abnormal function of the brain that leads to some of the symptoms of autism. But it doesn't stop there. What new studies show is that it's not just about cause, but it's about a, a developmental lifetime of experience. The brain continues to change the opportunities to step in, intervene, and improve the ability of an autistic child to do better and get better continues across a lifetime. So, lifetime gonna, of intervention. We're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. We do have a lot more information on our website. We link to the study, kpbs.org. Mm -hmm. Doctors, mm -hmm. thank you both very much. Thanks okay. for having us. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. The cost at the gas pump dropped a little over the weekend, but prices are still high compared to last year at this time. Surging gas prices have sent folks looking for fuel alternatives, what it means for some San Diego businesses in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8 on Antiques Roadshow in El Paso, Texas, learn how the innovative Mississippi rifle dramatically changed the odds in the Mexican-American War. Then at 9 on Queen's Palaces, see how Buckingham Palace, England's most spectacular, emerged from a swampy backwater over 300 years. And at 10 on an encore presentation of Antiques Roadshow in El Paso, a collection of signed Andy Warhol soup cans is appraised. That's tonight on KPBS. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, special correspondent Stone Phillips reports on the growing concern over football related head injuries in young children. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Gas prices unexpectedly moved into record territory in February. The surge forced many San Diego drivers to reconsider their budgets when refueling, while some folks considered other ways to power their vehicles. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson has the story. Free chips define the Casa de Bandini experience almost as much as the oversized margaritas. And all of the chips served at the Carlsbad restaurant are cooked here. As you can see, we go through a lot of chips here at Casa Bandini. And uh, we have a big vat that we make chips in. We go through about 32 five-gallon containers of oil a week.
That used cooking oil has to go somewhere. It's stored out back until Max Minahan picks it up. Go ahead, open my bin up. Unlock it. Take the cap off the hose. Go ahead and get the oil. Minahan works for an Escondido startup called Buster Biofuels. Turn the pump on. The company collects used cooking oil. Keep sucking. Filters it. Take my hose out. Treats it. Cap it. And turns it into biodiesel. Pack up and we're off. The firm has a number of customers, including Legoland. We have a variety of restaurants throughout the park that obviously produce grease through making the food. So we collect that and Buster Biofuels comes and picks it up to turn it into something usable. So the cars here are electric and they don't really run on fuel, but part of what Legoland is doing is helping build the energy future. We're using used cooking oil, which is a low value feedstock that we're able to uh, transform into biodiesel. Buster Halterman is the founder and CEO. What's going on, man? He's hoping to build a facility that'll be able to process all the used cooking oil he rounds up. The resulting biodiesel will be ready for the fuel tank. You know, most diesel engines need little or no conversions whatsoever, and it can literally be mixed with diesel fuel in virtually any mixture. So there's not a whole lot of infrastructure change uh, with the existing vehicles out there. Biodiesel blends are selling for as much as 30 cents a gallon less than regular diesel, but that can flip when the price of oil drops. Halterman says using biodiesel is like buying organic food. Sometimes the right thing costs more. However, he knows some people will only consider the option when fuel prices soar. You know, we can be highly competitive with petroleum diesel, and when prices are this high, you know, it's super appealing. Uh, the problem is, is our margins get squeezed, you know, when you get much lower than they are even right now because we don't do the volume that petroleum companies do, so we need to thrive on higher margins. Higher gas and diesel prices are also fueling interest in other alternatives. We're selling substantially more of the alternative fuels um, than we were even a month ago. Mike Lewis is the general manager of Pearson Fuels in City Heights. His station sells regular gas and diesel, but also natural gas, ethanol, biodiesel, and propane. He says fuel sales are very sensitive to price. Ethanol 85 sales jump from 250 gallons a day in February to 1,000 gallons a day in March. So a month later, we're doing four times as much. And what will happen if the price of gas falls, we won't sell 1,000 for very long, but it'll go down gradually and probably level off at a point above 250 where it started. He says the plateau always ends up being higher. As much as people hate to see the price of gas go up, over the long run, it does force the choices that are, don't have to be forced when gasoline's $2 a gallon. Eric Anderson reporting the average for a gallon of regular peaked at about 440 a month ago. The record price of 464 was set in 2008. President Obama offered a firm defense of his health care law today and warned unelected justices should not overturn the will of Congress. If you recall last week, the Supreme Court heard three days of arguments over the Affordable Care Act. At issue is whether the government can require all citizens to buy health care insurance. Joanna's talking with her guest about what happens if the law is struck down. Chris Van Gorder runs Scripps Health, one of the largest health organizations in San Diego County, with five hospitals, 26 clinics, and more than 13,000 employees. So, of course, we wanted to get his take on the Affordable Health Care Act and what's at stake when the U.S. Supreme Court makes its ruling later this year. Now, Chris, this isn't the first time that we've talked about health care. We profiled you in a KPBS documentary a couple years back, and I want to quote you something that you told me a few years ago. You said, health care would be cheaper for everyone if everyone had health care. So isn't that what the individual mandate attempts to do? Well, it certainly is, uh, is an attempt to try to get everybody insurance. Of course, whether or not people use the insurance for the right, in the right ways, for example, to try to keep themselves well as opposed to just waiting until they get sick and then uh, using the health care system. Um, so, yeah, to some degree, you're correct. That's what it's about. And do you support the individual mandate? We need to find a way of getting everybody insured, uh, either through their employer, 
um, the government or themselves. So I guess in that context, context, yes, I would agree that everybody in this country should have some insurance of one kind or another. Now, I know also in the past you've made the distinction in terms of um, defining what's wrong with health care. And, and you say it's really the economics of health care. What do you mean by that? Well, health care is, I mean, to be honest with you, it's broken. Um, and I'll be the first one to stand in front of anybody to say that the system doesn't work really for everybody right now. It works extraordinarily well if you're insured and you have access to great health care. For those people who are uninsured or underinsured, it's not the best system. Uh, the problem is, um, you know, in many ways, uh, well, we have 21 percent uninsured in this in this uh, state alone. That's seven million people. So right off the bat, you know, the system's broken if seven million, you know, California residents don't have health care insurance. Um, the other thing is, it's, it, for years, we've been cost shifting. The government does not pay their full uh, cost of, of providing uh, insurance for Medicare or Medicaid or even county medical services. And as a result, as, uh, ever since the mid-60s, we've been cost shifting that portion of the cost on those people with private health care insurance. That's created part of the problem right now in the fact that about $1,400 out of everybody's premium annually goes to pay for those who are uninsured or underinsured. So if there was a mechanism to actually have everybody insured, um, you know, one could theorize it anyway that at least $1,400 would come out of your cost on an, on an annual basis. So, and, and then the system itself is fragmented. It's, uh, we, uh, we have developed in our country a sick business. I often call hospitals sick business. If you aren't sick, we're out of business. And we get reimbursed actually to take care of you when you're sick. We don't get paid to keep you well. And we believe, at least at Scripps, we believe that we have to change that model. And I think a lot of healthcare providers do. And actually start using a lot of our resources uh, to keep you well. Uh, and we, you know, unlike what we've ever done in the past. I want to talk a little bit about emergency rooms mm -hmm. because I know this sort of plays into the uninsured. Often they show up there. The UT, uh, UT San Diego is running a series right now about frequent flyers, mm -hmm. people who are there more than six times a year. Uh, again, I'm going to quote you from another interview where you say that we do have a national health care system. It's called the emergency room. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, under the EMTALA laws, the federal regulations that require hospitals with a, with a basic emergency room to take care of all comers. Uh, in theory, that means we're supposed to stabilize the patient and then they can be cared for elsewhere. But in San Diego, like a lot of counties now, there is no county he health care system or hospital system. So if somebody comes to our emergency room, we have the legal responsibility and, frankly, the moral responsibility to take care of them regardless of their ability to pay. Um, that is the health care delivery system in this country. Everybody has insurance through their emergency room, but it's also one of the most expensive ways to get care and not always the most appropriate. With the uh, the UT series that's running right now, um, you know, there's the their old 80/20 rule. About 20 percent of the population uses 80 percent of those resources. The frequent flyer is about one percent out of that 20, and they use probably more than 80 percent uh, of of, of uh, the, the the dollars, the resources. So you know, there alone, we need to find a way of providing housing and preventative care for these people, so they don't end up taxing the 911 system, taxing the emergency rooms, and ultimately the hospitals, who in most cases don't end up getting reimbursed whatsoever for their care. We haven't got a lot of time left, but before we go, ultimately, if if the court strikes down this law. What happens to health care in California and in San yeah. Diego? Well, it certainly is speculative because we don't know for sure what the Supreme Court will do. But a lot of the states right now are talking California. The governor and the secretary of HHS here in California has already said that California will take it on themselves. Uh, they've said that maybe they'll pass their own uh, mandatory health insurance law in the state of California. The problem would be where do we get the money to actually take care of all of those people who can't afford to buy insurance? Uh, there was about $55 billion coming from the federal government from 2014 to 2019 to cover all of those people if um, you know it fu it's found unconstitutional that money in theory will dry up where will California get the money to do that okay Chris Van Gorder Scripps Health thanks for being here thank you federal agents may be taking a new approach against medical marijuana we'll have the story in just a moment this is KPBS evening edition
Tuesday nights at 10, only on KPBS. Throughout its 50-year history, KPBS's news and public affairs programs have challenged conventional thinking. We're investigating issues before they reach a crisis. Our world is much more than just today's headlines, and KPBS helps all of us explore what's next so that we can take action now. What are things made of? It all comes down to elements. And this must be hydrogen. Oh, oh. New York Times tech guru David Poe gives an off-the-charts tour of the periodic table. My gloves are on fire. Hunting the elements on Nova. Wednesday at 9 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KBBS Evening Edition. Federal agents are cracking down on the state's epicenter of medical marijuana. Today, they raided Oaksterdam University. KPBS first told you about Oaksterdam in 2010. We visited the medical marijuana training school in Oakland and spoke with its founder, Richard Lee. Lee authored Prop 19, the failed initiative to legalize marijuana in California. His home was also raided today by agents from the IRS and the Drug Enforcement Administration office. Officials would not comment on the reason for the raid. You can hear the interview with Lee and see inside Oaksterdam in the KPBS documentary, the Marijuana State, and you'll find that at kpbs.org slash marijuana. And earlier, you heard the head of Scripps Health talk about the cost of the uninsured on emergency rooms. We mentioned a series of stories running about so-called frequent flyers, frequent users of emergency care in the UT San Diego. We'll speak with the reporters on that story tomorrow on KPBS Evening Edition. Well, if you have a question or a comment for us, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and of course, you can always send me an email, jferian at kpbs.org. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. Former Mexican drug kingpin Benjamin Ariano Felix was sentenced to 25 years in prison today. He was also ordered to forfeit $100 million. Ariano Felix once led the Tijuana cartel, one of the world's most powerful drug trafficking organizations. He pleaded guilty last year to racketeering and conspiracy to launder money after being extradited from Mexico. And federal agents in San Diego took part in a nationwide sweep for immigration fugitives and illegal immigrants. A dozen people were arrested here during Operation Crosscheck. More than 3,000 people were arrested nationwide. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.